So, um, as mentioned, I'm Alison and I work with Keelan at the Infant Centre. Um, so we are kind of on the engineering side of things and we look into a lot of like signal processing, pattern matching and um, trying to help with diagnosis essentially. And my area is neonatal seizure detection and I'm using convolutional neural networks and Keras and TensorFlow and everything we talked about last time to actually do that. Um, so let's get started. What I'm probably going to do today is talk to you a little bit about the problem, about the problem with the detecting seizures, um, a little bit about the technology I'm using, so CNNs, and then a bit about how I'm actually applying it and how I'm adapting algorithms for this use. Um, so seizure detection um, in neonates at all stages of life is very important, but in neonates it's very important and it's also very difficult. So when a baby is born, if they suspect that there might be something um, happening in the brain, they will hook it up to all these different electrodes and try to look at the brain activity. And often um, the brain activity is the only indicator that there's actually a deep problem in the brain. So this is the first port to call when we're looking to figure out if there is something wrong with the baby. Um, and another reason we want to detect seizures is we actually have some medicines that can be prescribed to treat seizures, but these only work as the seizure is happening, so we can't retrospectively treat the seizures. So it's important that we're able to detect them and that we're able to detect them quickly um, so we can tell doctors or nurses that they're actually happening. Um, and when we think of seizures, we think of physical movements, we think of them being you know, very obvious signs that a seizure is occurring, and that's true usually in adults and in children, but in babies, um, two-thirds of seizures that actually happen at the subclinical level. So that means there's no physical manifestation of them, there's no movement, there's actually no way of seeing a seizure without looking at the EEG signal, so the electroencephalogram signal. That's the only way we can detect a seizure. And then, of course, you need highly trained specialists to in interpret this electroencephalogram signals, and they're not always available 24-7. So some kind of cot side helper would be really, really great. Something that could sit at the cot side and look at the EEG signals and interpret them and give some level of prob probabilistic output of whether something is a seizure or a non-seizure so that the expert can then be called in to make the diagnosis. Um, so that's kind of the reasoning behind this work and the reasoning behind uh, the development of a seizure detection system. So what you have here is you actually have an example of background EEG and seizure EEG. So you can see on the top, this is background EEG and what we have is eight channels. So typically in adults, you'd have a lot more channels. But if you think about a baby, their, their skull is much smaller. We can't fit as many electrodes. So we work with eight channels. Um, blue and red indicate different halves of the brain, so the different hemispheres. And what we're really looking for in you know, healthy brain activity in a neonate is randomness. We're looking for no patterns, no repetitiveness. We're looking for pure randomness because all of this, these little voltages, these are tiny little voltages, all that they represent are the different neurons firing in the brain. Um, and we really don't want any kind of neurons to be in different loops. Um, if you look at the seizure here, you, what you see is more ordered rhythmic activity. It's kind of predictable almost. You start to see these spikes happening um, at a discrete intervals, and that's what we don't want to see. So when you're looking for a seizure, you're not looking for anything specific, but in some ways you're looking for kind of order and patterns in randomness. So it's a very strange task. Um, but of course it's not that simple. There's lots of other things happening in these electrodes as well. Um, the electroencephalogram signal is really, really small. So obviously the signal to noise ratio is an issue. And um, here you can see nice spikes, which seem like you know, ordered pattern, um, uh, you know, regular patterns. But really what these are is they're the ECG, ECG, ECG signal after contaminating our EEG signal. So it's actually the heart um, beat is after contaminating the signal and that's why we start to see these repetitive spikes and those are not seizures. Again here, you see these nice little waves, almost like the crest of a wave. Mm. That's probably um, maybe like respiration artifact or the baby might even just be moving or babbling or feeding. So there's loads of different reasons why we might suspect something is a seizure in the EEG and why it might not actually be. So it's not as simple a task as I make out. So we're really looking for n something very non-specific. Um, the challenges of seizure detection is that they can vary in size, they can be large amplitude seizures, small amplitude seizures, they can vary in shape, and they can of course vary in the frequency that they dominate. Um, and they can be in one channel, all channel, or multiple channels. And this is just an interesting example because what happens here with this seizure, so you can see at the beginning, so this is temporal um, evolution, you can see at the beginning on one half of the brain, so in the blue signals, we have a seizure, but we have nothing on the red side of the brain, so we have nothing on the opposite side of the brain. But actually, over time, 
the seizure morphs and it moves into the other side of the brain. So this is an example of a seizure moving across the brain and it's hard to kind of define any clearer definition of what a seizure is when it can change its, um, uh, change its char characteristics over time like this. So how does this relate to the CNN or the image processing challenges is what I wanted to look at next. You know, where do we see um, this kind of variability um, elsewhere in the data and analytics tasks? So where do we see uh, these kind of characteristics in image processing challenges? Um, so in image processing challenges, often we're trying to look for a class of an image. We're trying to say this is an image of a dog or a cat or a mountain or a pig or something. So what we have here is we have a small dog, and this is just as much a dog as this larger dog, which is in kind of different colour pattern. It's in grey or black and white instead of in colour. And it's just as much of a dog as this one that's rotated. And it's just as much of a dog as the one at the other side of the screen, where we can only see 50% of the dog, but because we can still see the nose and the tail and the little bit of the ear and the collar, we're like, okay, that's definitely a dog. And even on the right-hand side here, the dog is occluded. It's, you know, you can only see a little bit of it but we still know that that's a dog. So this is another case where changes in lighting or changes in size or changes in rotation um, or the characteristics that are present don't change the class of what we're detecting. So in my eyes, this kind of is analogous to the seizure detection task where we could have a small amplitude seizure or a larger amplitude seizure or a seizure that's like varying across channels or even a seizure that's covered, it's occluded because we actually have a respiration artifact happening over it. So it's, you know, it's a bad signal. Or even you could have a loose electrode. The electrode could be coming loose. So you have a lot of noise in the signal. So there's kind of a lot of an, um, similarities between these two challenges. And one big way that people solve the image processing challenge is through convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks are almost the sole way we do image processing um, these days. Um, they really came to the fore during the ImageNet challenge. The ImageNet challenge is a challenge that's happened every year kind of in the past decade. And there are 14 million images in the challenge and there are 1,000 different classes. And you can see that you know, the, the error, which is along this axis here, was reducing every year until suddenly 2012 when we saw this 10% drop in, in error. And what happened in 2012 was uh, Hinton and Kurzowski came up with the AlexNet, and that really changed things. That was the first proper implementation of the CNN, and that's where people started to see the power. And then after that, you have um, VGG, which is another CNN implementation, and ResNet is 2015 one. And in ResNet 2015, they beat the human benchmark for this processing challenge. So this network is now performing better than humans on this particular image processing challenge. It doesn't mean that they're better than humans on all, all image processing challenges, but for this one, um, they've actually outclassed the, human, outclassed the human benchmark. So we can see that CNNs are very, very good at these tasks where the image can be variable, it can change over time, it can move around in the image. So that's why we thought, why don't we try to use this deep learning and the CNN networks for the EEG seizure detection task. So how do CNNs overcome all these challenges? Well, they have three things. They have local receptive fields, they have shared weights and they have subsampling, so they have downsampling as well. The local receptive fields are how the CNN knows that if two pixels are in a line or if three pixels are in a line, that that means there's a line there. Or if three pixels are in a triangle, that means there's a triangle there. They're looking for the spatial relationships between things. Um, and it's something that neural networks couldn't really do beforehand. They just looked for what was in, what was in the data set, whereas in the CNN, you're actually learning spatial relationships um, shared weights means that you're looking for the same characteristics across the whole image. So it means if you rotate the image, if you turn it upside down, you can still find, let's say, the dog or the cat within that image because you're looking for your features across the entire image. You're sharing your weights across the full image. And then the subsampling means that, okay, the dog is here on the left-hand side and the tail can be up high or down low depending on how the dog is feeling. Um, so the exact position of the features isn't important, we can do this kind of downsampling which kind of blurs where we're looking for the features. So these are three very important things that happen in the CNNs. So um, local re receptive fields are very, very important. Um, as I said, they have a small res receptive field which have spatially local pat patterns. Um, what that means uh, in reality is that if these are our image pixels across here, so we have five image pixels at the bottom of the screen, and this node here takes information from these three. And it only looks at those three 
and it learns a very simple um, representation because it's only looking at three pixels at input. Um, and then the next one along, it looks at the next three. And then the one on the right-hand side looks at these three. So all of these three nodes have looked at very simple amount of data, just three pixels of data, and it's learned you know, whether they're in a line or whether they're in a triangle or whether they're in a horizontal or a vertical line. Um, and that's its receptive field. Its receptive field is three wide. And if we go to the next layer, then each of these three pixels mm. has learned something interesting about the three pixels below it. And this next layer is learning from the following three pixels. So it's actually learning something slightly more complex because there's a non-linearity in there. So it can kind of make more of an interesting decision. And you can see that the receptive field, so this pixel here is actually dependent on all five of the input. So as we move up the hierarchy, we're getting more and more complex um, features, but we're still having just those small receptive fields. And how that works is maybe in level one, we might look for these lines. And lines are very simple, but they're very important. If we're doing edge detection, they're very important. So in layer one, we might look for these simple lines. But in layer two, we might look for, do those lines intersect? How do they intersect? You know, what shape does that make? And then in layer three, we might see, OK, there's two sets of lines next to each other. And then as we keep going, we might start to look for really complex things like texture or faces or you know, other complex things. But it really all starts at these simple, simple, um, small receptive fields at the input. And how this might relate back to our you know, looking for dogs task is that this might be the edge of a dog's ear. And then we've actually found, OK, so these two together, it's definitely the edge of an ear. And then, oh, well, there's two next to each other. So this is like a German shepherd with pointy ears. So that might be a characteristic that might tell us, oh, it's a dog. But it could be a cat or it could be a mountain. So it's a kind of a transferable feature that we could look for other things with. So that's our local receptive fields, which gives us this spatially local information and which allows us to have these different levels of abst abstraction to start with simple characteristics and work up to much more complex ones. The next thing we have is we have shared weights. So this shared weight is what I talked about earlier, where we look for the same feature across the whole image. So if the dog is in the top right-hand corner and the bottom left-hand corner, there's still a dog in that image. We can still say, you know, that class is met. Um, so what happens is we build feature maps of the likelihood of characteristics across an image. So if we have a weight, and that weight is looking for horizontal lines, we look for horizontal lines in the first three pixels and give a likelihood of that they're there. The next three pixels, a likelihood that they're there. And the next three pixels, a likelihood that they're there. And what we've essentially built up, we've said built up a map of the likelihood of that one feature being at every part of the image. And the important thing to note is that we've actually maintained all the spatial information. So we've maintained whether that line is in the left of the image or the bottom of the image or the top of the image. But we just have this map of the likelihood of that one feature being in the image. And we do this for many, many different ways. So you could do this for 100 different features and what you do is you build up 100 different maps of the features that are in that layer in the image. So, and they're all rep, or they're all, they all have spatial information maintained. And usually, in the first few layers, these are edge detectors. And then in the subsequent layers, you go on to learn the more complex um, hierarchical features like we talked about before. So those are our feature maps. And um, one network that I use in my work is this VGG network. It was developed in Oxford. And it's that network that won the 2014, I think, ImageNet Challenge. And um, it's really the first network that used very, very small receptive fields. So it's the first network where they really wanted to look at the most basic information at the input. So what you have here is you have an image. It's you know maybe downsampled or maybe rescaled in some way, but it's a raw image. No information is take, taken from it. You know, there's no no counting of you know, the light or the darkness in the image. It's really that raw image. And then what we have is we have three by three convolutions in every layer. And in every layer, you can see there's a number. So it's con 64. And the 64 there, or the 128, or the 256, represents how many of those feature maps we extract in each layer. And remember, the feature max maps count the number of features that we're looking for in each layer. So in the first layer of this VGG net, we're actually looking for 64 different feature maps. So we're looking at 64 different combinations of three by three um, weights. So there are nine different uh, values. And we're looking for to map those across the entire image. And by the time we get down to the end here, to the 512, we have lots of different feature maps actually extracted, which we probably have lots more complex features extracted. And that's why we need many, many. <coughs> so um, the interesting thing about this is that the first, how many, maybe like nine layers? convolutional layers 
Um, so they're the ones that extract these features. And they learn what features to extract through the backpropagation algorithm. But then the last three layers, so these are FC layers, which means fully connected. So they're the traditional dense neural network layers that we kind of that have been around for a very, very long time. And what really happens in this kind of an al algorithm, in this kind of an architecture, is that the first convolutional layers act as the feature extractors. So they're learned feature extractors. They figure out what they need to learn from the image in order to do their classification task. And then at the end, these last fully collected layers act as the classifiers. So they're the ones that say, OK, well, there was a, you know, a, a nose, and there was a collar, and there was ears, and there was a tail. So this is a dog. Or there was a wheel, and there was a road, and there was a door, and there was a person. So that was a car. You know, they're the ones that take all the extracted features and actually make a class of or do a classification or make a decision based on those features. And the interesting thing about the VGG net and what it's actually very good for is what's called transfer learning. So what we can do is we can take this VGG net and we can take the first convolutional layers and we can transfer them and use them for a completely different task. And all we have to do is retrain the decision making layers at the end. So if this was a, an algorithm that looked for animals, we could also make it an algorithm that looked, that decided which movie you know, this scene was from. So you could give it an image from a movie and if it was able to pick out loads of lions, it would say, you know, the last layers would learn to say, well, that's the Lion King. Or you'd give it an image from a movie, and if it could pick out you know, crabs and fish, it would say, well, that's the Little Mermaid. So we could retrain the network just by looking at the last decision-making layers because the first few um, convolutional layers are so good at picking out different features, and um, we can actually use this as a transfer learning kind of network. So it's very interesting from that perspective. But what am I doing? What does my network look like? And um, what do I do on a daily basis? So <coughs> I have used a net, uh, this VGG architecture as the basis of my network, but I've changed it slightly. So VGG is all for image processing. A lot of CNN stuff is for image processing. So it's all 2x2 two two convolutions, or 2D convolutions, 3x3 three three convolutions. But remember, I'm working with EEG. And the cool thing about deep learning is that we don't have to do feature extraction. So what I'm actually using is I'm using the raw EEG signal, which is just a 1D signal, and I'm putting that in. So you can see here, I have eight seconds of EEG. That's what it would look like at the input. It's sampled at 32 hertz. So I have 256 samples of raw EEG at the input. <coughs> I essentially have a 1D vector here. And what you can see is you can see the hierarchical feature extraction happening. In the first set of feature maps, so in the first layer, I'm just looking at three samples from my raw 256 long vector and I'm learning something from those. You know, I could be learning lines, I could be learning flat, I could be learning you know, anything from those. And then in the next layer, I'm looking at again three, three samples from here, so I, my receptive field has moved up to the four because I only have a shift of one. And then I'm learning a little bit more there. So what I'm doing is I'm not actually telling the network what to extract from EEG, I'm not telling it you know, to look for repetitiveness, I'm not telling it to look for order, I'm not telling it to look for entropy. Instead, I'm just giving it the raw EEG, and it's figuring out what it should be learning, what type of filters it should be applying to this raw EEG. And the whole thing is temporal. So you can see that the features up here still maintain their temporal um, relationship. So the most left-hand feature over here is actually related to the most left-hand section of the EEG over here, which is very interesting, and it allows us to make some kind of connection back to decisions at the end. We'll talk about that later. But what you might notice is very different between this and the VGG that I showed you is that I don't actually have any fully connected layers. So often in image processing, you have huge amounts of data in one image. Maybe your image is 255 by 255, so that's a lot of data. But I only have a 1D signal, which is 256 samples long. So I don't have that much data. And we all know in deep learning, or not deep learning, in all machine learning, <coughs> overfitting is a problem. So Instead of actually using um, densely connected layers at the end, which introduce a huge amount of parameters, um, I'm actually using um, kind of a way to manipulate the end of my network into creating two different feature maps, one representing seizure and one representing non-seizure. So you can see I have n lots of filters in each layer, this number of filters, lots of filters. And then in the very, very last layer, I'm just using two filters. I'm creating two feature maps. Essentially, I'm doing that scanning across the entire image with just two features, and those features, one is looking for the seizure, and it's scanning for seizures, and one is looking for non-seizures, and it's scanning for non-seizures. And then I'm taking the two values, 
that are come out of that come out of that scanning, and I'm saying that okay, they're my probability of being seizure and my probability of being non-seizure. So I can do some kind of a soft max function to make them into the probabilistic values then. So this helps me to avoid overfitting, and it allows me to have two feature maps at the end where one actually represents the location of seizure-like data in the image, and one represents, or not in the image, in the signal, and the other represents the location of non-seizure-like data in the signal. So this, um, this actually can be quite helpful from a clinical perspective. So it's based on the VGG network. There are 1D convolutions only, and there's no dense layers used. So how do we overcome these seizure problems that we talked about earlier? Um, the local receptive fields mean that we're actually looking at temporal information in the EEG signal. So the EEG is a temporal signal. And because we have locally connected weights, that means that the spatial relationship is important. And because it's a temporal signal, the spatial relationship actually means temporal relationship. So that's helping us there. Those local receptive fields are helping us learn some little bit of temporal information. Shared weights means that even though seizures can vary a lot and they can be you know, in lots of different positions, it means we're looking for the same weights across the, entire C or across the entire EEG signal. And the subsample means we're not looking for one set exact feature kind of pattern. Instead, we can look for kind of a, a little bit of a wider variety of patterns. And how does this compare to shallow learning? Well, the thing is, there's some really, really good seizure detection algorithms that exist out there um, that are based on like, very, very powerful machine learning classifiers like SVM, decision trees, there's loads of different types out there. And what they do is they have this pre-processing stage where we look at the EEG and we downsample it, and then they have feature extraction. So the feature extraction is where they actually look for all those things we talked about earlier. They looked for the different frequencies in the seizures or in the EEG. They look for the um, number of spikes in a minute. They look for the entropy of the signal. And because we know that all those things help us make a decision, help clinicians or help doctors make a decision about the seizures. So they use this kind of human engineered information to create these um, features that they're extracted. And then they use the machine learning classifier and then there's a post-processing step. And really what we're doing with this deep learning is we're actually replacing both of these blocks with one classifier. So we're, we can actually replace both the feature extraction stage and the classification and the decision making stage with one classifier. In that um, VGGNet, it was like the convolutional layers were the feature extractions and then the dense layers were the classifier. But the cool thing is that this whole section is now optimized in one routine. So rather than optimizing the features for the specific task and then optimizing the classifier based on those features, we're optimizing the entire thing end to end which is um, a much more valuable thing to do. So this is kind of the comparison between shallow learning routines. But of course, a lot more kind of intelligent and, and really good work goes into these things because they have to decide what features to extract and you know, there's a lot more decisions made there. Um, but we just did a performance analysis between one of the best seizure detection algorithms for neonatal EEG and you know, this convolutional network. So um, this is an SVM-based system. It has... Um, a lot of parameters, and ours doesn't have as many because we didn't use any dense layers, so it's quite the number of parameters in our network is very restricted. Um, the AUC, so the area under the receiver operating curve, so the um, analysis of sensitiv sensitivity versus specificity, theirs was 96.5%, which is really, really good, um, and ours was 97.62, which just um, kind of outdid it by 1%, but really at that point, 1% is a big, big increase. And then the sensitivity at one false detection per hour, so this is the actual sensitivity of the network when we allow it to make one false detection per hour. Because if you think about clinical context, you don't want the alarm to be going ev off every five seconds because it thinks everything's a seizure. We have to reduce the amount of times that the alarm goes off um, by mistake. So they were getting 88% for this sensitivity at one false detection per hour. And we were just getting 89%. So you can see that even without all that really, really intelligent, highly engineered feature extraction, we were able to make something that was very comparable and actually kind of outclassed it in a few of these metrics. And I talked about there the fact that the final two feature maps were a representation of the seizure and non-seizure elements of the input. So what I have here is I have a very long input. It's a minute of input. Usually you wouldn't have a minute. But the fact that we don't have any fully connected layers, you can actually vary the input as much as you want. You can put as large of an input as you want or as small of an input as you want because there's no hard-coded weights. All the weights convolve across the image. So that's actually another kind of interesting thing you can do if you don't have any dense layers. But what happened here is 
this one minute of um, EEG was put into, it's actually a seizure EEG, was put into the um, uh, algorithm and the last two feature maps I'm plotting here, so the last two feature maps are the ones that I told you we kind of manipulated to make them represent a non-seizure and a seizure e epoch map, or seizure, or feature map, sorry. So this is the non-seizure feature, or feature map, so it's very unlikely that it would be non-seizure, that the average is very, very low, the values are very, very low. Whereas this is the seizure feature map, and this is the one that's trying to detect what is a seizure um, <coughs> characteristic. So you can see here that this is very, very high. And the interesting thing is that we can actually, because the temporal relationship is maintained throughout the entire network, we have no fully connected layers, so we have this t maintained temporal relationship. We can actually say, OK, you know, where, was the, where were the most seizure-like parts, and what did they relate back to in the input? So what we can say is, well, here we had like a very high average for a few seconds, and we can say it related back to this part of the input. So that might give us some insight into you know, different clinical uses for a network like this. Um, but there's always problems. Um, so the first thing you might say to me is, it's a black box. Do you really know what's going on? When we extract features, you know, we're learning a lot about a signal. We're, um, we know what's happening. We know what we're looking for. Um, but why does this do so well? And that's, that's really important. And that's why it's important to you know, try to analyze your networks. And people are talking about visualizing different parts of their layers and different parts of their convolutional neural networks. And it's something really to bear in mind when you are developing like a neural network or a deep learning approach, because you know we, we can just kind of do it blindly and not think about what's happening inside. Another thing is, can we go deeper? And that's a great question, and I would like to explore that and see if we can, you know, get even better results by making a deeper or more complex network. Because you, you know, as I said, the deeper you go with your layers, the more complex the hierarchy of features you're extracting. Um, and then the other thing is uh, that transfer learning I was talking about. So we said that in images we can you know, use the same convolutional layers that were learned that extracted a certain amount of features, and we can use them for other image processing tasks. But is there a way that we can use these kind of EEG features that are being extracted for other EEG processing tasks, maybe where you want to detect sleep cycles or you want to detect, you know, different, um, you know, types of brain waves? And that's also something that would be really interesting to explore, I think, in future. Um, but that's everything I have for you today. So thanks very much. I'd love to take questions. <laughs> when it comes to there, is there any uh, choice in picking what features are picked out? Because it might have a statistical importance, but not a practical importance. So yeah. Statistically, it might actually be important, but practically it's not. That's the thing, like, you know, you're, you're putting in something raw and you're letting the network decide what is extracted. And that's actually one of the drawbacks because, as you say, you, you, you know, there, there, there might be some value in knowing what features are good and what features are bad. You know, there might be a lot of value in learning about that. But... Um, I, I don't know of any way to, to manipulate what features would be extracted unless, of course, you did some kind of feature extraction stage beforehand and got a value for that and put that value in as part of your input. So, you know, um, use, use that value as an input feature almost. So I'm not doing any feature extraction, but maybe you could do some feature extraction and extract one value. I don't know what it would be. Like, let's say here it would be the frequency and the lowest subband, the 0 to 2 hertz subband and put in the signal, which is the EEG signal, and also put in that frequency at some point in the network, you know, concatenate it at some point in the network. That would be the only way I would know. But I don't know. Sorry. So, nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, on the EEG signal, so you have a time series, um, is it important that that time series is contiguous that, um, as the inputs to the net? Um, they're connected, so you know each millisecond is next to each millisecond um, relates to the first layer of input, or are they completely randomly? Um, during training, definitely they're completely randomly inputted into the network. So, so like so one from ten minutes, yeah, ten seconds yeah. could be next to one from exactly seconds. because no no information is maintained historically. So every time I present something new to this network, this a new eight seconds to this network. It doesn't remember the last eight seconds I presented. There is no kind of recurrent. There's no actual like temporal learning. That would be more kind of LSTM or recurrent neural network. So it would be a long-term, short-term memory network or a recurrent neural network. Where, as you say, the last information 
would have some significant value on, or not even some va some input on the next information where if the last second was a seizure, well, surely you could take some information and say the next second is probably a seizure. But I don't have that in this network at all. No, this is that's that's a little bit more complex network. And do you think that's an advantage or because uh, I mean, obviously, what you're doing is you're randomly sampling the signal, so you're not you're saying I'm going to start with a completely open mind. Exactly. It might be there's something that happens in event yeah. uh, three seconds that has an impact on event eight seconds. Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely think th that kind of temporal information and helping the network by giving it some history w would probably help, but I haven't done it yet. But I, I, do, I do think there would be an advantage to that. But then if we also think about during training, you don't want to present it with loads and loads of seizure epochs in a row because it might, if you think about you know, your local minimum um, plot, it might sit in this local minimum where it says everything is a seizure or everything is a non-seizure. So I think it's important during training to do, like uh, when you're training something like this that doesn't have any historical context, um, to do very randomized training, to not train it on loads of seizure stuff in a row or loads of non-seizure stuff um, in a row. I'm probably got a similar question. It's just, uh, I always associate convolutional with imaging. So yeah. are you actually processing this as an image? Are you taking an image as opposed to a signal? It is a signal in that it's it's a it's a it's a one D vector. Okay. Um, but there's no real difference between a two D vector and an image, really, is there? If you okay. Think about it. Okay. So. Um, I, yeah. I'm just intrigued because, uh, and again, it's a new field. So a recurrent neural network is something I would have thought would be the perfect the for natural. signal. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah, yeah. But you're. It's interesting. You're going. This has got. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that this has gone well, but. The reason, actually, is there's like a thing how I ended up doing this, but I was looking at the the eight second epochs of EEG represented as spectrograms, okay. and so then the obvious thing to do would be to use convolutional neural networks. Okay. And then we kind of thought, okay, well, the spectrograms weren't representing all the data. The second you create a spectrogram, you're actually losing some of the information that's in the EEG. And um, so we said, what if we just go to raw EEG yeah. and put that into the CNN? And so, so I can see how it doesn't Sorry. make sense that I've gone from signal to yeah. something that's not LSTM or not temporal. But it, it but it has worked. And I think it has worked because we've kept it potentially as a temporal signal. So there is some small temporal relationship within the eight seconds, but there is no historical connection to the previous eight seconds. And you're doing epochs at eight seconds, and then you're labeling that as this is a fine, this is fine, this is a, this is a seizure. Yeah, yeah. And then some post-processing after that. So this isn't instantaneously done right now it's not actually kind of streaming online right now it's all done histor like um, retrospectively so we can do some post-processing and manipulation and moving average filters after that okay. to help but there's and that there's one i'm just going to against yeah. any other Sorry. types of algorithms or um no no other deep algorithms i haven't tried to test it against other deep algorithms but you can see the svm algorithm um, which is a machine learning algorithm more than anything. And one quick one, dynamic time warping, have you tried that? That would be very interesting, and I haven't, <laughs> <laughs> but that would be very interesting, yep. to, yeah, very, very interesting yep. to look at. Sorry, um, who, who was first there? Anyone? Um, I was just wondering, um, since your sort of EEG <coughs> display a lot of channels of information, like for the left and right side of the brain, mm -hmm. um, have you done any work on combining multiple signals with other signals? I have done a little bit of work on that, yeah, but, um, I think the issue, uh, but, uh, but I haven't done anything that's been, you know, fantastic yet. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. But I think the interesting thing about that is, so I order them as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But really, there is no actual order to those eight because they come from all different parts of the brain. You know, they're kind of spatially in 2D way they're represented rather than, you know, one is related to two is related to three. So it would be important if I did do that, if I did look at them as all eight together that I wouldn't have probably shared connections between the channels, that the, yeah. the connections would only be within the channels because I can't say that the relationship between, you know, four and five is, is the same relationship between one and two. But yeah, that's, that's a good thing to pick up on. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, that was one thing I was going to ask. Um, the other was, is there a particular reason for eight seconds? Could you just pick longer? Or? No, um, there's no particular reason for eight seconds. And I've been looking at longer, and longer actually seems to be doing what better. But the interesting thing about this architecture that um, I mentioned is that even though it's trained on eight seconds, we can use it on 16, 32, 64 second inputs because there's no fully connected layer, which means that there's no you know, temporal, there's no weights that are hard coded. So all the weights are convolving. So um, I've been using networks trained on 16 or networks trained on like four seconds. I'm, I'm currently trying to do some larger experiments where I'm training it on one and testing it on another, so kind of mismatch conditions to see if I can get anything out of that, but it's another, another big project. 
Um, are you good question. Pardon? Are you doing any overlapping on your windows? Yes, um, actually seven second overlap, so it's, it's eight, eight shift one second. Okay. So I'm getting as much data as possible. Because with neural networks, probably the more data the better. Yeah. So if you think about the fact that, and I can't, so Keelan talked about you know, warping images and changing images and creating more data out of that. Yes. But with this, it's, you know, I think I would have to have someone with clinical t context mm. sit next to me and say, okay, if, if I warped this seizure, does it still look like a seizure? Because I don't know if that is still a seizure. So one way I can cr create data <coughs> and make as much data as possible is by having as much of an overlap as possible. Okay. Because in theory, that's making more data. Yeah. It's kind of a, a way of making more data without knowing much about the field or yeah. without being an expert in the field. Sorry, just uh, two quick questions. Um, are you getting live stuff? Are you doing live tests yet, or is it still on recorded data? It's still on recorded data, yeah. Are yeah. you looking um, at something that's extremely rare or something extremely common? Extremely rare. This is a massively imbalanced problem, a massively imbalanced problem. It's probably, you know, if I have, and all of the data that I have are actually patients who have suffered from seizures, so, you know, it, um, but still only about maybe 6% of my data is seizure data. So it is imbalanced. But during training, that's one thing with neural networks. During training, I'm balancing it. So during training, I'm taking, OK, I have this much seizure data. I'm going to take you know, twice as much non-seizure data, but I'm not going to use all of the non-seizure data, because otherwise I'm going to end up with something that's not training very well. So I'm kind of balancing the data during training. So you're scoring. You're scoring and using an ROC. Are you seeing it? Or? Yeah. Okay. And that's OK for? Class um, yes, it's probably better for class imbalance okay. than accuracy, but but yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. I was wondering, did you, did you look at F1 macro or? No, no, I haven't, and probably is better for class imbalance, but yeah. I haven't because because the metrics I was comparing to when yeah. I started these experiments were them. those, yes. and I just started comparing. But yes, if yeah, for yeah. for a better or maybe a slightly more robust metrics to look at, it would be interesting to look at. I know it's a real bugger because you're trying to compare and then someone else is using accuracy figure. Exactly, you know. it's like you're trying to match the kind of historical yeah, thing, but yeah, yeah. You can't help us in fair comparison to okay. I'll oh. be around anyway if anyone wants to say anything else, if I'll let you go. Great stuff, so uh, great talk, Alison. Thank you very much indeed for that.